All right, good day, everyone. Um, well, yep, as, as mentioned, uh, my name is Zach, head of engineering at the Code Company. Um, I live and work here in Sydney, but the Code Company is based up in, in sunny Queensland. Um, we specialise in enterprise WordPress development. Um, myself, I've been building WordPress sites for about 14 years now. Um, and I really love helping people solve problems with code. Um, I came to love WordPress because of the amazing community and the ecosystem as well. Its plugin and theme ecosystem provide a fantastic foundation to build things on. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm of the opinion you can build almost anything with WordPress. Not that you necessarily should, um, but you could if you wanted to. Um, in today's talk, we're going to keep it pretty simple. There's three main things um, we're going to talk about. Um, I'll start by answering the question, what is MVC? Um, we'll discuss each component that makes up MVC, specifically, specifically focused on the context of WordPress development. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about WPMVC, which is our internal framework at the code company that we use as the backbone for all of our projects. And we'll look at some real life use cases of that. Um, and at the end, I'll share the code for our MVC framework as well that you can take a look at. And if you want to use it even in your own projects, you're welcome to do so. And then we'll finish off with some, some learnings and some key things that um, we, we've learned over the past couple of years using MVC with WordPress development. So what is MVC? Um, for those not familiar with MVC, um, MVC is simply a design pattern. Um, it's a great way to structure your code base while segmenting different um, functionality into different areas and separating backend logic from your front end. Um, it's kind of like a blueprint. Um, that's how I like to think about patterns. And because they're just like blueprints, you can use a lot, any, really any kind of design pattern when you're developing. It doesn't have to be MVC specifically. That's what we're going to look at today. But you could really use um, any other design pattern as well that you can, uh, you can think of. There's a, there's a bunch out there. Um, and there are really multiple ways you can do the same, the same thing, which is the great and fun thing about coding. Um, today we're going to look at how we use MVC within the WordPress content, context specifically um, and how you can use that to structure your own plugin or application code. And what do I mean by structure? Well, at its most basic and practical, instead of the way I like to think about this is instead of having maybe one large file we're all familiar with, you know, functions.php in a theme, um, that contains all the code for your plugin or your theme, you can break your logic into separate files. So you might, you know, you can break different components of your code into separate files. And this is an extremely common way of having structure in your code base is just file separation rather than having everything in one file. And most of you are probably doing that already to some degree. Um, so what does MVC specifically mean? Well, if you haven't guessed it yet, it's an acronym. Um, the M stands for model, V stands for view, and C stands for controller. And we'll look at each of these now in a bit more detail. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about sort of the more traditional usage of these, these components of MVC, um, but I'm going to try and focus it more, sort of steer it towards how we use it in WordPress development um, and show some practical code examples as well. So uh, in a traditional application, model is uh, M is for model, and M is our uh, model, which is the representation of the data, usually in your database. Um, in the context of WordPress and our projects, we generally think of this as representing WordPress objects. Um, so you know, you'll be familiar with some of these classes in WordPress, posts, terms, um, users, comments, all of these are WordPress objects, and we sort of think of these as um, you know, the models that are sort of built into WordPress. And these models, they correlate to data that's in the database. So for example, you know, if you think of WP Post, there's a WP Post table um, that has data associated with, with each of those um, pieces of data. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about models is they are quite flexible. So it doesn't have to be something directly corresponding to data in your database. You can actually create models that represent data that's not in your database. Um, we've used them for things like add units. You can get quite creative with it. And anything that you kind of need to um, represent that has data attached to it. Say, for example, with add units, you might have size mapping, um, targeting, things like that. A lot of that can be um, attached into a model and used that way. So I want to show a little practical example of this. Um, let's imagine you have a website that displays movies. 
Um, and in our example site, we will be building, we have a custom plugin that contains all the functionality for the site. And in there, we'd have uh, a class, we'll call this movie.php, which is our mo movie model. Um, in our use cases, our post type models basically replicate and extend the WP post class so that we have all the functionality that's uh, included with, that comes along with WP post. Um, but we can kind of extend on that and build on that and build custom functionality into that. Uh, so you might be familiar with code that looks like this, um, where you might be getting uh, what we call a properties of uh, an object. So in this case, you've got a variable, a little arrow symbol, and then a string after which just represents the, the piece of data that we, we want. And this also corresponds to data in the database. So in the instance of WP Post, this is you're actually fetching that ID, um, and that is corresponding to what the ID column in the database. Um, but with custom, you know, with custom models, you might, you're not going to have a column in the WP Post table for that data. Generally, you would use Post Meta. Um, perhaps, perhaps you might have a custom table. There's a couple of different ways you can, you can have that data uh, stored. So in this case, maybe we'll have the release date of the movie. That might be one of the pieces of data that we have for this particular um, this particular model. And uh, the cool thing about models is we can have helper methods that are on, on are built into these models. Um, and this is where we really find the model classes come in handy because these helper methods allow us to fetch uh, data in a much more streamlined way um, than you might do with traditional um, WordPress development. So uh, an important note as well is that when you are creating these models, um, we typically recommend using a factory class. Um, and I don't have time in this particular talk to go deep into um, factory classes specifically, but there'll be some code examples. We'll include that in our repo at the end. You can have a look at and how we actually use factory classes to create these models. Um, so these helper methods, uh, instead of having code, you might be familiar with code like this, um, where you're getting movie release date, you're going to use get post meta to get a piece of meta associated with that. Uh, with a particular post ID. Um, the way that you could do that with, uh, with a model is you would have your model there, movie, and then you would use uh, what we call like a helper method or just a method on that model called get release date. And we create that and then inside that function you can have all your sort of logic to actually get that. Maybe you want to do some formatting or some you know, other manipulation of the data. And it can be really nicely self-contained in there and you don't have to um, you know, if you're using this on a theme file, for example, you don't end up with a bunch of, you know, all this logic sitting at the top of your theme file trying to, you know, uh, manipulate the data. You can have it a lot, uh, a lot uh, more contained and nice and clean in, that, in there. Um, once you start building out your applications more, you'll really start to see the value of these model classes. And what we've found is that the more we've used these, the more we get familiar with doing this, it's, it's hard to go back to doing it the other way. Um, and we really, so you really start thinking, oh, how can I, you know, how can I add this into a model and start using it that way? Um, so we found that to be really useful. So here's an example of what that model class might look like. So uh, in our use cases, we have this WPMVC framework that we extend off. Uh, it's got a base class there, generic post model, that we are extending off. And at the top, we are setting, this is optional, but we like to do this uh, just to keep things nice and, and tidy. We have a constant there where we're setting the, the meta key that we'll be using to fetch our release date. And the value of doing that is that uh, it's, you're able to uh, update things all in one place. So you can actually then use that reference throughout your code base if you needed to update, say, what the meta key was for whatever reason, do it in one place. You don't have to go search and replace it throughout your code base. Um, so you define something in one place and you have to update it once, which is great. Um, and then we have our get release date method. And uh, in this case, we actually have a helper method already on the base class, which is a wrapper around get post meta. Um, but you can see it sort of keeps everything nice and contained. And if you had to do any other manipulation or, or logic in there, you can do it in that function um, and keep it on, the, on that class. And it sort of keeps your template files quite, uh, quite tidy. Um, in this example um, here, I've added in what we would have, which in the actual way that we would, we would create this is we'd have a movie factory and we would get our movie. Uh, we'd use this helper method, get by ID, pass in the post ID and it would return us that model. Um, which we can then use to get our get release date from. So next component, the V of view, uh, which stands for view. This is your UI layer. Um, generally, it handles the display and layout of the data. 
Um, in the context of WordPress, though, we generally use views a little bit differently. Uh, we, we tend to rely on the theme to handle our views. Um, we don't use really the views in the traditional way of an MVC framework. Um, if you need a view on the front end of your site, this would usually be handled um, by the theme because that's what it's good at doing. It makes more sense to let the theme handle the UI. There are a few cases, though, which we've used uh, view, the view component specifically. Um, things like admin UI templates. Uh, maybe you have like transactional emails that you have template parts in there that you want to use, you want to pass variables into. We've used that. Um, really anything that doesn't really rely heavily on front-end styles or components, we've used um, views for. Uh, because the views, you'll generally have your build tools within the theme, sorry, you'll generally have your build tools in there. And that's where you might have like Tailwind or whatever sort of front-end frameworks you're using. Um, and we want to sort of keep those, those parts of the code separate if we can. Um, so if we were to use this in the example, um, we might have a file like this in a template directory within the custom plugin that we're building, um, maybe emails and then a, a template file in there. And in this case, we might have a notification email that's sent to admins uh, when a movie is created. We're going to pass into it the movie title. The actual template file, though, will need to be registered via a controller. And this is how we would do it in our particular framework that we, we use. Um, we have a themable view class that we pass in the template part and some configuration there. And then we set a parameter there, we, this helper method that's provided. We set in our movie title and then we, we render that. And that will be done through a controller, which we'll get to in a moment. The actual file itself might look something like this. This is obviously just example code, but um, down the bottom you'll see here we're using, we're able to access uh, this variable and use the helper method there, get param, and that will actually just return the, the value that we pass into it. It's very similar to get template part. So get template part, you can pass in arguments. Um, it sort of works in the same way. But this way we're keeping it separate from the theme. We're not actually bringing this into the theme. This would sit inside your custom, your custom plugin. Um, but we do prefer to use the theme for handling most of the views uh, on our projects. And next is controller. And this is uh, where most of the, all the fun stuff happens. Um, so really the way we think about controllers is this contains our primary business logic. Generally it will tie the model and view together in a traditional MVC framework. Uh, but how we use controllers is a little bit different to pure MVC. Uh, we use controllers um, to really modify or customize and add to WordPress behavior. So this is where we register our hooks. So add action, add filter, we register them inside a controller. Um, in the same way that you're probably doing that already um, in your own plugins or in the theme, um, we just use this as a more object-oriented way to uh, contain all our logic together. And you can even use it to yeah, modify other plugins as well. And the main benefit is we can group related logic together into one particular controller. So um, I'll look at that again in a moment, but that's one of the big benefits of doing it this way is that you can you really, using that structure benefit of having a pattern design pattern and keeping related code together in the same, same file in the same place as well. So let's say for example, we've got our, we're gonna register that movie post type that we're gonna need on this project. Um, the way we have it set up uh, in our projects is that we have every controller has a setup method at the very top, which you can think of as just like a, you know, your normal construct in a class. And um, basically this gets called every single time a controller is loaded. And this gets loaded, called um, on the plugins loaded hook. So pretty early in the chain. Um, it's gonna register our post type and then we'll register a, a save post hook as well. By logically grouping all this related code together into controllers, it does make it a lot easier to find what you're looking for. So, you know, for example, um, when we, we do this, you know, if you open up a code base and you think, okay, where are, you know, where are my chron, maybe you haven't looked at it in a while, you're like, where are my cron events registered? And you go into the plugin and, you know, just logically the way we think about this, we'll go, okay, where's my cron controller? And, you know, we'll find the cron controller in there and that's where all our cron, cron events are registered. So it's a great way to keep your code organized. It makes it a lot easier to find things as well. And when you're jumping between projects, um, that's a, something important to think about. Um, and you can even start, oops, you can even start putting controllers into subfolders as well. So as the number of controllers grow, you can start as well grouping them together into subfolders um, and just really helps with organization. So here's what a sort of summarized version of what one of our controllers might look like. 
Um, you'll see this is class movie post type extending our base uh, controller class. At the top, every controller will have that setup method, um, and we'll be called, that's where we register our hooks. So they will go in there. Um, and then you can see there, there's our actual methods down there, actual functions that get called um, for our hooks. And there's multiple ways that you can, you can do this. This is just our preferred way of doing it, um, using like an array in this and then passing in the name of the method. It's just a nice, clean way of doing it, but there are other ways of doing that as well. Um, and that's really a very high-level overview of what MVC is. Um, it's a way, great way of organizing and separating your code into, and logic. Um, we have our models that represent the data and have you know, helpful methods attached to fetch and manipulate that data. Views, which is typically our theme files. Um, and then at the heart of our projects, the controllers uh, register all sort of the, the, function, the main functionality of our, of our websites. So now we've seen how to use w, uh, MVC. Um, I've been mentioning WPMVC a little bit. And a few, a few years ago, we decided we really need to standardize our own internal approach to building projects for clients. And this resulted in us building a very basic, very basic MVC framework that we use on all our projects. Um, so this is what WPMVC is. Name is pending, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, but that's what we're using uh, at the moment. So we'll start talking about a little bit what WPMVC is and what it isn't. Um, so firstly, it is a composer package. Um, so it's not a contained plugin. You have to build a plugin um, separately to this, and then using Composer, you would require this package in. It's a framework that sits behind your plugin, provides all those base classes that then you can use um, in your own plugins. Um, and so you can be quite flexible with that. Um, and all of, our, all of our sites will have a custom theme and a custom plugin. Um, it's a pretty standard approach. Because of this, it's been intentionally built as a framework and not a plugin, and it's pretty lightweight. Um, it does not include like every bell and whistle and possible feature you might expect in other frameworks. Um, it's not Laravel. It's not like a fully fledged MVC framework. Um, we've tried to keep it very, very small and focused on WordPress. So in that way, it is a little bit opinionated um, and hopefully not confusing when you look at the code. Um, it has a very specific way of working, but we've found this to be very sufficient for all the needs we've had so far. And we're trying to do things the WordPress way as much as possible in our coding and in our projects so that we have maximum compatibility uh, with WordPress. Um, and although it is opinionated, we have also made it pretty flexible. Um, and this is because our projects will have a lot of similar requirements, but in the same way, they also have a lot of you know, unique requirements for every project. So we didn't want to include client-specific code in this. We wanted to keep it very lightweight. Um, and also, I should point out that WPMVC is not WP space MVC, um, or what we found out when we went to um, make this public this week was that there's a lot of frameworks out there called WPMVC. So we weren't super original with the naming, um, but it's worked well for us so far internally. And so there might be a name change in the future, we'll see. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, I guess, give that caveat uh, for that there. So um, we'll, I'll go through this quite quickly, um, but I just wanted to show a quick sort of view of what a typical project structure might look like. And I'm not going to go through all of a description of all these files. At the end, I'll point you to an example repo where you can have a look through. Um, but basically, the flow of this is that at the very top, say within our MU plugins directory, you would have a uh, an, sort of an, an entrance file, an entry point file. We'll call this project alpha.php. And that will include the boot.php file, which is in there. Obviously, naming conventions, this is, this is how we've set it up. And in there is where you would include your Composer uh, autoload file that is generated when you run Composer install. Inside there, that is where uh, they'll obviously create your vendor directory. And inside there, that's where WPMVC sits. Um, we have a few directories in here. You'll see our source directory, which is a primary one that contains our controllers. Um, we have our models directory that contains our models. Um, and you can see there sort of how we structured that. Uh, we also then have a functions directory that sort of contains, and these are some of the more, more miscellaneous directories. So inside miscellaneous, we might have um, a functions directory that has some like auto-loaded function, functionality, um, a library uh, directory that might have things like third-party APIs that we need to include if they can't be included via Composer. Um, so that's sort of a rough view of what that project structure would look like. Um, and as I said, like in the code repo, you'll be able to see a, a bit uh, more of a, a nicer view of that uh, in GitHub rather than a list point on a slide. Um, so WPMVC, we've been using it in the wild now for around five years. Um, and I just wanted to sort of show two quick little um, sites that are out there on the web that 
we, we've used this on recently because um, as, like, as a developer, I like to see where things are being used on the web and other projects that are using these sort of things. So uh, we'll have a look at these quickly. So uh, one of the ones uh, we finished this year recently was Wondermind, which is a mental health startup. It's a fairly small um, project from a back-end perspective. It's very much heavy on the front-end side. Um, on the back end, we've got a custom ME plugin and custom theme. Um, and this is built on w uh, the custom ME plugin is built on WPMVC. We've only got around 10 controllers that mostly just register post types and taxonomies. Um, and there's maybe one or, one or two that handle some other custom code used on the site. Um, this is around three custom post types and around six custom taxonomies. So uh, not, not, a, not a huge project um, from the back end perspective in the code base. Um, but it, we've used MVC uh, to quite a success on that pr project. And then on the flip side, a larger project, um, which was Fujifilm, which is a big, uh, big, obviously most people would be aware of this uh, camera company, make some cameras. Um, we've got over, they've got over 40 languages on their site. It's a WPML project, over 100 controllers spread across five different ME plugins. Um, that obviously contain the core of the site functionality. There's another one for custom content importing. And each of these five ME plugins uh, have MVC, WPMVC as the backbone for each of them. There's around 25 post types, 10 taxonomies. It's, as I said, it's a combination of multi-site and multilingual, and around seven plus developers are working on that. And one of the benefits um, that we'll look at in a moment, but one of the benefits is we're able to bring developers on quite quickly to the project that we're familiar with WPMVC in our own company and you know, being able to ramp up from going from a small project to a large project because you're familiar with the, the way that the project structure is structured um, is, a, is a great benefit there. So um, I'm going to wrap this all up a little bit with some learning and benefits that we've sort of learned throughout this process. Why do we like this approach and what have we learned from it? Um, so benefits, number one is really just consistency across projects. Um, and really using any framework consistently will get you this. Um, so it doesn't just have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be WPMVC, any framework that you use or you know, project structure that you use project by project. Um, if you're using something consistently, that's, you know, that's where you'll see those benefits um, because developers know what to expect when starting a new project. They can also switch projects easily without a steep learning curve. Um, and, you know, just when you, whenever you learn something well and get to know it well, it, you're going to be able to code a lot better, a lot faster. Following on to the, the first point, it's a lot easier to find uh, your code because when your projects are consistent and basically structured the same way, Obviously, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you'll have in your head where things are and then you jump to a new project, maybe it's using that same framework, it'll be a lot easier to find that code or find similar code again. And this has been an issue in the past when we're working on really big projects and you're jumping onto a new one. It can take a long time to ramp up just trying to find where things are. So having a consistent approach um, will, will make that a lot easier. And we've also been able to move all of our PHP logic out of themes and into an MU plugin so that our themes can really focus on the front end UI and our logic can be held in our, in our custom plugin. And just removes confusion. It's like, where should I register this? Should it be in the theme? Should it be in the plugin? It sort of removes that confusion there. Um, it's easier to maintain and include now as well. So moving to a framework that's included, you're able to include via Composer has made it a lot easier um, to, to bring, you know, and much more flexible for us. And we're not having to like copy and paste or use a separate repo and just clone that into every repo that we're working on. We're just able to require it straight in. Um, and it also makes it a lot easier to update because we can update that package and then we can roll that update out to, to other, um, other projects as well. And then less overall, just less tech debt coming into each project because starting with that, starting with a pretty minimal framework means we're not bringing in any additional bloat and we can, re we can really start um, we can, if we want to, we can start from a completely blank canvas or we can use sort of other projects as a starting point as well. But the basic, we're not bringing in you know, other client specific code into each of our projects when we're starting off. Um, and overall, you know, we try to keep it doing things the WordPress way. So it's not, if you're familiar with WordPress development and object oriented programming, this stuff isn't, it's not rocket science. You'll be able to pick it up pretty quickly. Um, and it, you know, for other developers as well, coming in front end developers, even that don't have as much experience perhaps with, um, back-end frameworks or um, it's probably less common these days but it's, it's a great help to them as well because it's, it's quite simple. 
And then with learnings, there are a lot of learnings, but I wanted to just focus really on just two primary um, learnings that we, we've had throughout this process and, and using it on a lot of projects now. Um, just ob the obvious one, keep it simple. Um, you don't have to use large, complex frameworks um, for, your, for your projects. Uh, as you saw, like even just a simple MVC framework so, or even just style structure, doesn't have to be a framework, just a consistent structure on every project can go a long way. Um, and you know, what, what, I wanted to hope, what I wanted to get across with those different projects that I showed was the same sort of thing can work on a small project and it can also work on a massive project as well. Um, as long as, you know, if you, as a developer, you really understand the frameworks and the code that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, then it'll be a lot easier to, to build these projects, whether you're junior, senior, um, picking up uh, new projects will be a lot easier because you're familiar with that particular code base, a way of doing things. And then the obvious as well, structure uh, is good. Um, it can feel limiting or opinionated to have structure, um, especially if you're not used to it. But any structure um, really is going to be overall better than having no structure, especially when you start building um, more and more projects. Using a tried and tested design pattern such as MVC um, can benefit your projects and it can also you know, benefit you as a developer as well. Um, there's a lot of design patterns out there. You know, go try, try some different design patterns and see um, how they work, learn to understand different ones and see which one you know, works for you and for your projects. And obviously, you know, Structure also provides consistency, which is, which is good and has its own set of benefits as well. Um, so what's next with WPMVC, as mentioned earlier, we wanted to share um, WPMVC. Whether you use it or not, you might be able to take some ideas from it um, and use it in your own plugin. Um, we'll be continually improving it as well, um, and, and so I'll share that at the end. Um, some of the things we're hoping to look at sort of working towards next is trying out some other um, sort of patterns and, and design um, ideas within our, within our plugin. So we're going to look at potentially looking into dependency injection and some other patterns like the strategy pattern um, alongside or maybe instead of class, uh, the way that we're using classes right now, um, including to use, uh, to use traits more as well. Um, these are obviously techniques that have been around for a long time, but um, WPMVC in the way that we've built it so far has worked really well over the years, but we're looking at you know, how can we improve it, how can we make it, make it better. Um, we're also looking to include a thing, um, things like CLI tooling. Um, one of the things we love about Laravel is they have really great uh, command and tooling system to be able to quickly scaffold models, scaffold controllers. Um, so we're hoping to bring that into WPMVC as well to make uh, spinning our projects even, even faster. Um, and then everyone can have better docs, but that's something we're hoping to, uh, to improve at the moment. We don't have much documentation on this. Um, the code is the documentation, so we've tried to document within the code um, quite, uh, quite extensively, but we'll, we'll try and uh, put together some better documentation um, and examples as well as to how it can be used in your own projects. Um, so uh, yeah, if you're interested, it's available on GitHub. Um, you can check it out. Uh, it's also a composer package on Packagist. Um, and there's an example repo as well there if you're interested uh, and you want to go check it out um, and use it. Uh, if you've got any feedback or suggestions for it, let us know. We obviously use it on our internal projects, so we're not really open to contribution at the moment. We're just um, going to, because we use it very extensively, but if there are you know, ideas or suggestions, always happy to hear them. Um, and if you do have any questions, please let me know. I'll be around today um, and a bit tomorrow as well. And yeah, thanks for listening. That's it. Round of applause for Zach. Quick show of hands. Who learnt something? Who here has used MVC before? OK. We've got some time left, though. So who has some questions? Yes. First question. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Um, Two questions. Uh, how have you found the onboarding ramp of new developers with the abstraction of, I guess, core WordPress methods? And have you implemented any standardized getters across different, uh, I guess, data types within WordPress? So standardizing the accesses for posts and terms, uh, et cetera. Um, so first part, uh, overall we found it the onboarding ramp um, has been a lot easier with something like this. We do have like internal documentation on how to use it. So when new developers come on board, we're able to sort of walk them through how to use it. 
Um, and we've got the example repos as well that we help de new developers so they can use that and to get ramped up pretty quickly. And generally, like once you understand where hooks are registered, which is sort of mostly how we interact with WordPress anyway, that's like that we find that like developers don't seem to have an issue with that because um, it's fairly straightforward, just like these are where the hooks are registered. Um, it does take a little bit, if you're not used to object oriented programming, it does take a little bit of uh, time to wrap your head around it, but we've found it generally to be like quite quite good. Um, and then your second question, yes, we you would have seen like we extended a lot, we have some base classes in there that we extend, and the, on those base classes we do have a lot of helper methods to things like getting post meta, um, you know, getting term taxonomies. Um, there's a lot of helper methods in there. Um, and if you have a look at the code, you'll be able to see all like that are available. But yeah, we, we do use that quite a bit so that we're not having to repeat or write that custom on every project. Yeah. Okay. First of all, thank you for the talk. Can I just turn this off? <laughs> okay, it works. Um, I noticed that you were using the MU plugins. Mm. Um, for some people, that can be a little bit difficult to update, deploy, particularly if you've got one plugin across multiple projects. So let's say, for example, like I have some where we have code reuse, right? Mm. Lots of companies have like a staff listing, so we make one plugin and reuse it many times. I tried using it in MU, found updating a little bit of an issue. What are you guys using for deploying uh, your plugin into the MU space, and do you have any tips for people deploying into that MU space? That is a great question, and I feel like that's something that we are still, we probably haven't perfected that process yet, I would say. Um, because our MU plugin, we generally only have one or two in there, and they are custom to that site, we don't, like, we don't really have that problem of having to update the whole plugin itself, so, because if we're doing that, we're, we're, in the, we're in the repo, we're actually coding it directly into there. Um, and we have, like, we've thought about that a bit as well. Like, yeah, if we needed to update something globally across a lot of sites, plugins directory is probably either it probably needs to be in there, or you have to use Composer to some degree to to manage that. I would say. Um, and you can. The great thing about Composer is you can use like private repos and things like that in Composer. You don't it doesn't have to be like a public Composer package. You can include and update. You know, use that to include private repos. Um, so we've, we have used that a little bit as well, um, like our coding standards internally, we have that as a private repo that we can include um, and stuff like that. So that's, cool. does that kind of answer that question? Yeah, look, I knew it was a difficult thing. Um, I've faced troubles yeah. with it as well, so that's why I was asking just to get any tips for those people here. Yeah. Um, the other one as well is you didn't really touch on the UI in the administrator interface. Mm. So a lot of people obviously use ACF, uh, Metabox, those kinds of things. Um, do you guys using a particular thing for editing uh, and creating those fields in your MVC framework? Um, because I know you're adding fields with your model, but there wasn't much touched on to say, oh, this type of field might be a lookup or a variation or a, you know, sure. whatever. Do you have any tips around what you guys are using for that actual user interface on the admin adding of data? Yeah, um, we, we generally use, um, we use ACF for most of our fields. Um, and that, that in the config directory within, we use ACFJSON, so that's how we store that, and we're able to version control our fields that way. Um, and then what we've done typically, on especially on a lot of our newer projects, is we just have a trait that we call like ACF trait, and in that has a lot of like um, wrapper functions around the normal ACF functions to, to pull those in. Um, and so that's how we would register it. Um, and then when we have like on our, we would have that version controlled, um, and then we just we would use that to sync those fields up to production sites. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. Any more questions? Hi. Um, the closest thing that I've used to using MVC is uh, by using Timber. Um, I, I like it very much because of the. A templating engine, the Twig templating engine that's built into it. Are you uh, considering, or are you using some kind of templating engine also in your uh, views or something? Um, not really. Um, we don't really use a templating engine specifically. Uh, if it's front end, we just rely on on WordPress, and then if we we might have some front end frameworks like Tailwind, things like that. Um, but we don't use that. Um, I haven't used Timber specific, like extensively, um, 
but we've, I think we've, u we've used on some projects, um, it, it's a bit hit and miss. It can, be, it can be hard to debug issues with those sort of, when you're using a templating, um, a specific templating framework we've found, but yeah, we try to keep it very sort of simple and just use WordPress templating engine as much as we can. Okay, thank you. Come on, don't be shy. You've got to, everyone loved this talk. Someone's got to have another question. Anyone else? Please. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned that you're not really open for contributions. Is there a specific reason for it? Don't you think it actually would um, give a bit more push uh, towards the actually getting more out of plugin when uh, more developers are working on it? Thanks. Yeah, great question. I think like probably long term we might look at doing that. Um, the reason we haven't opened it to contribution just yet is mainly because we use it, it, we're very new to open sourcing this, like we use this internally on all of our projects. So we have to be very specific right now about what features we would include or what things we would change about it because we would need to ensure like maximum backwards compatibility with all the other sites that we're using it on. Um, but you know, I, I'm definitely like we're definitely not necessarily opposed to to that in the future, and we we'd hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, but just right for right now, we're just keeping it sort of I guess closed source in a way. Um, but we wanted to share the code at least so that you could you know get inspired by it if if it's um, if you want to learn something from the code base and then examples as well that you can use. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's basically the main reason why we haven't done that yet. Yeah. Thank you once again. I uh, maintain and build a starter theme, I guess, or a framework for WordPress myself. Um, it'd be great if we could, I guess, yeah, collaborate and create a repository almost of a lot of different uh, starter themes. You know, there's the big one out there, which is Sage um, from the Roots team. Yeah. Um, and it's great every now and then just looking at what everyone else in the space is doing so we can all learn from each other. Is that something the uh, company is open to? Um, we have to have a think about it, but I mean, I think that's a great idea. Like having, I know they, I think they have like those showcase sites for like custom themes and things like that, or things that are, that are built with WordPress. So something like that might be interesting to sort of bring that together more from like the code side of it, right? Like sort yeah, of seeing what from the framework side. Yeah, for sure. I think that'd be a cool, a cool concept to do. And uh, another question, mm -hmm. uh, custom tables. Have you uh, d jumped into that uh, little spaghetti room there of uh, using custom tables for anything with the models and does your current framework have, uh, I've had a quick look through, I couldn't ask anything for custom SQL tables instead of using our favorite mega post table. Yes. <laughs> um, look, we, 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 don't, we, we only use it if we really need to. Um, if, it's, if it, if it is, becomes a performance issue. Um, uh, what we've, we've found some success recently with using um, a plugin, I think it's called Hook Turn, which is a custom, that works with ACF and it can convert ACF into sort of like, use, that, use custom tables for that. Yeah. Um, so we do have custom tables on some sites, but we try, like we only go there really if we really have to, um, for the obvious sort of additional complexity that adds into it. Um, so there isn't, there isn't any code specifically in WPMVC to handle that scenario. Um, but on a lot of the newer projects, um, uh, like I think on the, on the Fujifilm project as well, for example, we, we used uh, Hook Turn to, and that made a big performance impact, especially if you have any fields that handle relationship. Yeah. If you're doing that through a custom field, um, massive performance benefit by doing something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Another round of applause for Zach. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and the questions, especially the questions. Uh, you're around all weekend, I assume? Yeah. And happy for anyone to ask you any question at all, anytime. Sure. About WPMVC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule still, so if anyone has a last question, find him down here afterwards. Uh, we're just going to take a very short break while we switch our speakers. A uh, quick request for everyone in the room. If you come into this room late, please use the second door uh, to avoid having to open the main door. Uh, it's a lot easier on the volunteers and a lot less noise. <laughs> I guess that's it.
Thank you. I'll grab your microphone.